Hello everyone at Euroscientist. This is Technoculture. I am Federica Bressan and today I'm here with Patrick Wheeler, expert and educator in cybersecurity and co-founder of Cyber Wayfinder, a training program in cybersecurity. Patrick was my guest on episode number 26 of this podcast. Welcome Patrick. Thank you Federica. It's a pleasure. So we touched on several aspects of cybersecurity during our interview. I would like to go back to how you present the topic to people and what their reaction is. Is it more common that they are unaware of the risks they are exposed to, or they know it, but we can't do much, so we don't care, so to speak. We are resigned to that. I think there's a little bit of a combination of both. And one of the challenges I find is that a lot of people know to be afraid. They've gotten the message to be very afraid, but they're not exactly sure of what they're supposed to be afraid of. And most importantly, what they're supposed to do about it. So this level of fear mongering that has gone on, I argue, tends to leave people in quite a passive mode uh, and feeling quite a bit of a victim of it. And so they shrug it off and don't engage with the topics the way we would like people to. So that there's a, a large and widening gulf, I would say, between people who are trying to address this issue and the people that it is being played out upon. Oftentimes when we think of who should we be afraid of, we tend to think of someone unknown, someone somewhere that we don't know. But sometimes there are ex-spouses or family members for some reason, or friends that through mobile apps, spyware, can collect data on ourselves for ill-intended purposes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. There's a lot of things that are going on sociologically that are quite bad in the uh, cyberspace. There is some discussions recently about some of the spyware applications that were available uh, for sale commercially. And so this is something that is often used by an abusive spouse, by someone who is looking for reasons or ways to manipulate somebody. And if you're able to get inside of someone's phone, you're able to trace their every activity. Uh, you can become uh, someone who feels like you have a sense of knowledge and an advantage over that person. And once you have that, people tend to want to use it and to display their knowledge. And so this lends itself to a slippery slope of behavior that is quite antisocial in many ways. And there have been some really unfortunate examples of bullying and uh, really nasty behavior that comes out from this. Is it different from buying a webcam and placing it somewhere, a surveillance camera which you might have in your garden mm -hmm. and you can use it to spy on someone? Sure. Or is there a difference because, you know, it's like these apps follow you so the level in yeah. which I can monitor the, your zipper. Exactly. The other thing is the level of intimacy that most people have with their telephone, which is where a lot of these spyware apps uh, like to be placed, um, is of course much higher than a static location in your house. But indeed, when you have someone who's quite knowledgeable, and we had one case where we were trying to help a particular person, they were a couple who were separated and they had two young children. And so the one of the partners installed the spyware applications on the children's phones and this raised the ability of this person to really monitor almost everything that was going on in the separated partners space they were able to monitor the fact that they were now in a new relationship they would basically know almost everything that was going on this person also hacked into an inside of the house uh, webcam uh, which often a lot of people have they did not get into the alexa and some of the other smart home devices that we have but you can easily imagine that someone might do that and as we go to a more digital home uh, the ability to secure this stuff and to actually lock someone like this out, especially someone who previously had a trusted uh, access and had access to accounts, is actually quite difficult and a lot of people don't have the knowledge of how to deal with this. Uh, there's a very interesting organization called Tall Poppies who have done some things around this and are trying to basically raise some money and to become a successful company around trying to protect people from this type of cyberbullying. So there's a, there's a lot of stuff to be done in this. 
you can uh, see this in just uh, interpersonal relationships, uh, and it's not uncommon for this to happen. But also this goes to a much higher degree when you look at the NSO spyware, which is uh, stuff that has been used a lot by nation states or political parties to spy on opponents. Um, arguably, it was running on Mr. Khashoggi's phone when he was killed in the Saudi Arabian embassy in Turkey. So these types of malware and spyware software work on both a very personal intimate level but also on a geopolitical level and it can be quite astonishing when you realize the level of intrusiveness this type of thing can have with you. You see right now in Russia a requirement that all software or all hardware co components sold in Russia be preloaded with specific applications. You can see this in China as well with the argument that China is building quite a pervasive monitoring state where everyone is monitored at all times. There are those who argue the UK has gone this way with their closed circuit televisions as well. So this is one of the things when you look at technoculture we need to ask ourselves, how are we building the cyber future that we want to inhabit? This concept of privacy, what does it actually mean in the digital uh, realm? And this is one of the things where I believe Europe with the GDPR, with a lot of the social discussions that we've been having around privacy, really has something to say in this domain. Because our legal structure hasn't caught up with all of this stuff. An abusive partner who loads a piece of spyware onto your phone should patently be illegal. But in many legal jurisdictions, we don't know what to do with that behavior. Well, even asking if the data you collect from me in that way could be brought in court as evidence is besides the point. I think that what I want to ask you is, it seems to me that the law is always one step behind the state of the art of cyber crime. Will it keep being like that? Yes and no. Uh, I think that in part my practice is uh, I deal with a lot with cyber crime and anti-fraud systems and anti-money laundering systems. That's a lot of what my day job is involved in. And if you look at cyber crime, a lot of the police forces and a lot of the people who are thinkers around this topic say that what we're effectively dealing with is just cyber enabled crime. Crime is universal. Crime has been around since long before binary came around. And crime will continue to be around for a long time because this is humanity. Humans commit crime. The computers, not so much. So one of the challenges we argue is how do we deal with this fact that crime is now being disintermediated with space? because typically in order to steal something from you, I had to be in physical proximity with you. And so what we've done with the internet and with this age of digital crime, we've not necessarily come up with entirely new crimes, although I would argue there's some nuances that we really have not seen before in humanity, but we've come up with some things that are really accelerants to this criminality. And one of the biggest things is, I argue, this sense of pseudo-anonymity and this really gives rise to the cyberbullying and the flame wars that we would uh, see going on and a lot of the stuff that we see on social media where people, once they get behind the screen, believe that they can behave in completely jerkish ways, like some people do behind the wheel of a car. Uh, so how do we create a civil society online that encourages good behavior, discourages jerks and jerkism? Uh, this is one of our big challenges for us, to build the internet that we want to live on. This spyware you can install on my phone, I don't know much about it. Does someone need to have my phone in their hands for a period of time to install it? Or it can be installed without me knowing it automatically. I click somewhere and I, I install that. It depends on how much you want to pay. And it, quite literally, we can send a piece of malware to your phone. Uh, there was a vulnerability announced recently in WhatsApp. Uh, 
that was announced and patched. It was announced at the time that it was patched. But at one point, people could send a text message to your WhatsApp phone, which would then allow them to delete the message before you received it and allow them to download malware onto your phone. There are also lots of ways where we can try to trick you into downloading an application. So you download a flashlight application or a free game, and that comes loaded with malware as well. Uh, so there's a, a bit of a difference between opportunistic attacks and what you might call software supply chain attacks that are very broad impact and perhaps indiscriminate versus incredibly targeted attacks where I say, you, Federica, I know your phone number, which is most likely running on your smartphone. I will look at a camera, a still picture that you've taken recently. I'll look at the metadata of that picture. I'll see what model of phone that you're using. And based upon that, I'll target an attack directly against you. Those are the types of things that are, I mean, it, it literally, it, it spans the gamut from a very targeted attack, from a very knowledgeable attacker who has nation state level tools at their disposal, to people who basically indiscriminately put up malware ridden applications in the Google store or in the Apple store, hoping that people will download so that they can get something interesting, so they can steal credentials, or so that, that someone interesting might happen to download their products. They. This is always Ah, they. indeed, they. Who they. are they? Who are yes. they? Indeed. So indeed, your more targeted attacks are likely to be someone who is interested in you geopolitically. Uh, you may be someone who's a politically exposed person. Um, you, I'm sure you know of the case where people were listening to Angela Merkel's phone calls a few years back, uh, those people being the NSA. So they, of course, being the nation's uh, spy agencies can be part of them. But it's really important to recognize these days that run-of-the-mill commercial actors and the idea that a lot of cyber criminality is really low-level criminality. These are people who are buying and selling malware and exploits on the black market, uh, what people like to call the deep web or the dark web. And these types of exploits and exploited profiles can actually be sold. And so someone can sell your profile for a few euros. And so there's an active ecosystem online of criminal groups. These criminal groups exist in many different geographies, uh, but it, it's not so interesting for civilians like us to worry exactly where they are or who they are. Uh, that's something more for Europol and Inter Interpol and some of the named agencies. When these groups get to be too effective or too impactful, uh, we can hope that civil society has some corrective mechanisms. But by and large, there's a huge amount right now of what I tend to call low-level street crime that is existing in our digital ecosystem. And so they are uh, someone who has bought an exploit online or bought your credentials or is trying to do some small criminality involving one of your accounts. Having said all this, so in this landscape where one can be the target of several different types of attacks, how do you actually go about presenting cybersecurity to people without raising anxiety? Sure. This is one of the things that it's difficult to do. And one of the things that we argue is it's anxiety comes often when you don't feel in control. And so the biggest thing that we're trying to do to deliver to people is control of their digital ecosystem to help them understand what the exploits are, to understand what the attacks are, what the common vectors are, such that people are able to take as much control and as much due care and due diligence as they can, it's a little bit like getting into a car and buckling your seatbelt and making sure that uh, the digital dashboard shows you that, yes, my airbag will inflate in case of an accident. And yes, my mirrors are oriented in the correct location such that I can see things that are behind me. You also help people understand what their risk tolerance is and what is it that you do online and what are your expectations of privacy online? What can you reasonably expect? What can you not expect? And how you can go about trying to correct some of this stuff. A lot of the advice that's out there 
doesn't really work unless you sit down with someone and spend a fair amount of time walking through it with them. Telling someone to use strong two-factor authentication, to go through their Facebook profile or their LinkedIn profile and lock it down, it, it's good advice and it's important advice, but that's actually a several hour exercise. And so sometimes it's really useful to sit down with people and actually do this with them. And this is one of the ways in which we try to deliver control to people. One of the things I do in my corporate setting is we run cybersecurity masterclasses. And this is where we take anywhere from two days to a week of eight hours to 10 hours a day. Depending on the length of your Facebook wall. <laughs> oh, well, it's not just Facebook, of course. Uh, in, this, in the corporate setting, we're dealing with a lot of different challenges for people. And when you start to uncover both your personal digital ecosystem as well as your corporate digital ecosystem and what it is that we need to understand in order to be good cyber citizens and how we can take responsible charge of our duties and responsibilities as adults in this cyberspace, that's actually a fair body of knowledge and a fair amount of practice that needs to be done. And so it takes an investment of time. And so giving someone an advice of here, look on this link or don't be stupid, that's not effective and it's not beneficial in many ways as well because it doesn't lead to the type of behavior changes that we're looking to, to try to help people have. In their, I would say, emotional response, have you experienced some personal, private individuals reacting more or maybe some CEO when they realize the responsibility they have for an entire business? There's, a, there's an exercise that I really love to do exactly about this. And it is something where it's, it, it is t targeted to senior executives and it's targeted to any of your audiences that are involved in digital matters and have a position of responsibility. And there's a lovely website called Have I Been Pawned? If you Google that, you'll find it. It's run by a, a researcher named Troy Hunt. He's an incredible man who does some really good work. And the idea is that you put your email address in there, the email address that you use to sign into Facebook and into so many other sites. And he will tell you how many times, and if he knows where, that email address with the associated password that you don't give him, you just give him the email address, that that email address has been used and where those the email address and the password were lost by someone else. So for example, if you put my Gmail address in there, you will see that LinkedIn lost my Gmail address along with the password that I used to use on my old LinkedIn account. And so you can look at my Gmail account and see that it's been pawned or it has been hacked because somebody else lost my credentials, no fault of my own, about five different times. And so I love to do this with a room full of CEOs or C-level executives and say, place your, your email in here. And everyone, you know, chuckles and we, you know, hey, I have the most, I have the least. And, and, <laughs> and the room has a good laugh. And then I stop everyone and I say, how many of you have children that have email addresses? And I ask them to put their child's email address in this website. And without fail, at least one person in the room goes bone white because they realize that they have a trust and duty of care for their children that is different from their own personal risk threat tolerance. I might drive my car a little bit fast. I might not lock the door quite so much when it's my own personal risk. But when it's the risk of my child, that risk tolerance is very, very different. And I use that exercise again and again with rooms of, of leaders to say, please, dear leaders, consider your cyber responsibility to your corporation the same as you do to your child. And if you don't have children, I sometimes ask people if they have elder parents that perhaps would be victimized by some of the um, cyber extortion or the fake uh, support desk calls that are so prevalent these days, and ask them to put their parents' uh, email address in there to see how many times they have been called um, or how many times they've been caught by this. And this is actually, I think, a really, really useful exercise. And I, I owe a great deal of gratitude to Troy Hunt for this website because it allows this type of discussion in a safe space uh, and I argue this is a really important around this discussion because just being afraid isn't enough we need to be able to take that and turn it into action have I been pawned yes let me try with my address okay you should google it first because it's p-w-n-e-d 
So, but if you Google "Have I been pawned," you will most likely get to the correct site. There, exactly. Email you, address. Just your email. No passwords. Nothing else. My Gmail. I'm scared. <laughs> I, I I I noticed that. I'm sure. I'm surprised. Pawned on five breached sites and found no pastes. What okay. does that mean? So the paste bins are places where you might have had some of your data up on online repositories. But there have been five companies that you have used your username and password that have lost your password in addition to your username. So does it tell you which breaches they were? Because normally if you scroll through there, it will show you which uh, places, uh, which password uh, lists he got them from. Yes, I see one. I see a major platform Okay. there. I don't know if I should say it. And another. <laughs> uh, LinkedIn. Uh, the, the, the thing about this, I would love for you to hear what I said before. This is through no fault of your own. You didn't do anything wrong. You didn't go to a bad website. This is LinkedIn. That's a, a, a normal place for people to be. A lot of people have a Yahoo account, and we know that Yahoo got hacked. And this is one of the reasons why we tell people don't use the same password on different sites. Because once one site lo loses the pairing of your username and your password, there are people who automatically feed this data and will try to log into every single site using that username and password, just hoping to get lucky. So they'll use that same one you use on LinkedIn, hoping you used it on your Amazon account, hoping you used it in your Twitter feed, or hoping you used it in your iCloud account so they can download the private photographs of you. How does this one platform know about breaches? Where's the, the, the log? Where does Troy Hunt get his things? Exactly. You mean, have I been pawned? Is there sure. a log of lost passwords somewhere? You know, it yeah. makes no sense. Sure. So basically what happens is that in the criminal underground, people hack into different systems. And what they're looking for is the database of username and passwords. And periodically, these can come available for sale online. Once they've been around for a certain length of time and the criminals have used them long enough and they no longer have a particular commercial interest, they'll actually paste them online or post them online so that anyone can use them and download them. The criminals are very social. Um, they also <laughs> like to get credits for... <laughs> the hey, criminals are very social. They are. They're, they're people, too. This is one of the most important things that people feel when they look at the the vision of a cyber criminal is this person in glasses and a balaclava with gloves in the dark uh, typing at a keyboard. No, no, these are people who are social, they're trying to build their own social status. There's a lot of things that go on uh, within this ecosystem in this community of, of criminals that uh, is a directly parallel to uh, social activity that we see in, in everyday social medias. And so someone who wishes to gain credibility will post a database full of username and passwords and say, look at who I hacked, because that gives them credentials. And so Troy Hunt, as uh, a lot of other security researchers do, we have a lot of police officers and a lot of nation state actors and a lot of security researchers who spend time in these dark web environments looking to see what the criminal elements are doing. And so when he finds these databases, he pulls them in, he secures them in a, in a good way because quite often they're not well secured. So he is, uh, as I said, he's a very respectable researcher and there's, I don't work with him directly, but there are people that uh, do work with him directly quite a lot. And uh, he basically does a public service through this product, trying to help us understand how vulnerable and exposed we are and trying to use this as a, as a good tool to help us be better at it. Now this doesn't mean that I should do anything with my Gmail account. The email address is fine, but I should probably go and change if I haven't yet the passwords. What should I do when the listeners go on this website and many of them possibly, if they've right. had the address long enough, will find this? What action do I take? So this is where the first action is to do a little bit of reflection. Don't panic, don't rush, don't feel insecure or inferior. Um, the most important thing is to stop for a moment and realize what has just happened. I've, I've told the words to you, it's not you, you didn't do it, you did nothing wrong. So take that mantra, take a few deep breaths, 
And then examine your digital ecosystem. Examine your usernames and passwords. And for example, look at your Gmail account. Is your Gmail account important to you? Most likely it is. And so you can do a lot of things around the security of your Gmail account. And the best person to talk to about that is actually Google. You can go to the security tab inside of your Gmail account and you can actually spend a good length of time going in there. Changing just your password is just going to set you up for the next fall. Okay, so I, I really encourage you to engage with the Google platform around your Gmail account and understand what Google can do to allow you to put strong security on it. So for example, I use two-factor authentication on my Google account because I do have some things that I consider quite sensitive in there. No naked pictures, please. Um, and for many years, I didn't consider that I had sensitive things, but a friend of mine was very clear to me. He said, Patrick, I send you things that are important to me. I send you discussions around my workplace, around my relationship, things that I expect you to take care of for me. So again, when I look at my Gmail account, don't just look at it as your Gmail account. Look at it as the trust that others have given you in the messages that they've given you inside of your email account and say, I need to secure my account, not because of me, but because they have placed trust in me in that location. And so from there, I made the decision that my Gmail account is always under two-factor authentication, meaning that if I want to log into my account, I either get a text or I have to provide a certain passcode. Uh, and basically, I have taken reasonable precautions to put as much security on my Gmail account as I can. We're here in the middle of the EU in Brussels right now. This is a place where a lot of counterintelligence activities go on. There's a lot of politically exposed persons. And so Google will actually allow you to raise your hand digitally and say, I'm a politically exposed person. I wish you to put my Google ecosystem, which includes your maps, your searches in your maps, your favorite places in your maps, um, where you have been, if you allow traceability in Google Maps. Uh, it allows them to place additional protections over all of those types of things as well. Um, this is particularly important when we look at the elections that are going on and the fact that people are targeting people to get intelligence around uh, the voting process and to see how they can destabilize the electoral process. So Google is, I argue, a very responsible citizen in what they allow you to do. The next step, of course, is to recognize that Google is selling data about you to their commercial partners and to understand what that ecosystem is about. But indeed, phase one is to look at your Gmail account, look at your Facebook account, your Twitter account, all of the cornerstones of your social media where someone might be able to embarrass you and ask yourself, do a little bit of reflection, how can I lock this down and how can I be the responsible person so that it's not my account that gets hacked? I think you're great but that it's really hard to talk about these things without leaving a feeling of stress a little bit because I feel, I feel like that. Um, I, I had a lady came up to me the, after a speech I gave in Helsinki uh, last year and the way she described it was, she, number one, she was complimenting my presentation because it, it was an hour long, so a little bit longer than we have here, most likely. But she said that so much of the other information and other presentations that she had had left her with such a feeling of inadequacy. And I would, I would argue, number one, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that our industry leaves you with a feeling of inadequacy. But I would like to believe that this is something we're used to overcoming. We're used to doing some due diligence and we're used to doing a certain amount of work to overcome this feeling of inadequacy. And there's no fault, again, associated with this. So many of us who are in the middle of our careers or in the middle of our ages, this digital ecosystem grew up around us organically. We never had to actually stop and take a little bit of time and look at how this system works and try to understand and figure it out a little bit to, to get our feet more level set. And so if there's anything I would say is to someone who feels afraid or inadequate is to say, we hear you, I understand. Please, let's work to get beyond that. And what I ask is to invest a little bit of time. Start with two hours. Our digital ecosystem is worth two hours. 
Um, and then I would actually love if you were to get involved with some local community people and to get involved. There's people who do crypto parties if you want to get really geeky about it. And here they tar start talking about anonymity online and Tor onion routers and all of these things that we do to try to protect our privacy online. Um, this is becomes really important if you're uh, a journalist, uh, someone who is active politically or someone who's traveling internationally extensively. These types of things become very important for you. But I argue they're also just very important things to being an, an informed digital citizen. I promise I'll let you go, but I have one last question because this is now I have my services, passwords, I can check and already I'm not very much in control. Mm -hmm. But what happens after I die, for example, you know, does that belong in cybersecurity somehow? my digital presence mm -hmm. you know what can you say something about Absolutely. should i prepare are we thinking about it Th this is so unfortunately this does happen uh and it has happened a lot there's actually a wonderful book that i have the misfortune to be reading at the moment called the beginner's guide to the end uh, and i'm reading this because some of my family members are facing this situation and there are checklists of things that you should do as you're doing your last will and testament if you're reaching a point in your life when you could expect to be dying and there are a lot of things about making sure that your facebook uh, accesses get memorialized if you want them to be memorialized or if you don't want them to be memorialized to actually take them down and to be able to tell facebook um, please delete everything after this person dies. It is a very sensitive uh, and difficult process for a lot of people. Um, I used to have some friends on emailing lists that I would re frequently send uh, travel dialogues to. And I remember very much receiving an email from a lady saying, um, your friend died, please stop sending him these email addresses. It distresses me to, receive, to open up his email box and receive them. This was an indication that this family was not ready for his death. He died suddenly of a heart attack. I didn't even know about it. And they didn't prepare themselves for how to deal with how much of his digital life was in his Gmail account, how much of his bank accounts, how much of this type of stuff. So she needed to read all of his private email correspondences from people like me who hadn't seen him in years. And so this was a very difficult process for her. And so indeed, we do need to look at what happens to our digital life after we're gone. I love to tell the story of my cat's Facebook page. I'm not on Facebook, but my cat used to be. And my cat died. I reached out to Facebook and said, Dear Facebook, uh, my cat died, so I would like to memorialize his page because he was a lovely cat and, and, and I was quite sad by this. Facebook wrote me back saying, Dear sir, it looks like you're using your Facebook page as a pets page. And Facebook terms and conditions don't allow that behavior. Facebook is only for people, not for pets. I didn't know if you knew that. I certainly didn't. I didn't read the terms and conditions of the Facebook page. I have some pets either. among my friends. On exactly. Facebook. Facebook is very tolerant in doing this even though it violates their terms they're very happy to sell your pets views of I assume pet food products uh, I'm not sure how much buying your pet actually does online but anyway Facebook refused to memorialize my cat's account which I thought was very rude of Facebook but then I also expected them to summarily terminate and delete my cat's account uh, come to surprise, uh, a couple years later, I logged back in and it was still quite active. Thank you very much. Um, so my dead cat was being listed in Facebook as one of their active users. I considered that was very rude of Facebook, but um, among the rude things Facebook has done, that's not the rudest by a long shot. Yeah, that's something that I had never thought about and that would require a, a completely different discussion. But how can you prepare? Even if logging into all your services and yes. deleting the account is difficult, the thing is, what if after I'm dead, all these things keep existing and someone breaks in Absolutely. illegally? Absolutely, and this is very important. It's also really important if something were to happen to you suddenly. And so, for example, when I go traveling, I make sure that someone else has access to all of my accounts. 
usually that's my domestic partner and she has access to those accounts anyway. Um, and so this is something that we try to make sure that we have this either in a physical safe, in a safety deposit box, and there are people who know how to get to these accounts. So you don't want to have someone having to try to contact Facebook uh, or contact uh, um, whatever your social media page is. So this is something that's very important to consider the entire life cycle of our accounts. One of the other things that people are often not as aware of is, is how to deal with our children and how to help them be online and do that well. What level of privacy do we allow children? What level are we not? At what age do we allow them to engage in certain types of behaviors? As we see the bullying and the other types of things that are happening with children, this is really a, an important question for us and one that we don't have really good answers to. So I would say on both ends of the spectrum of our lives, um, those baby pictures that uh, parents so gleefully post that can be incredibly excruciatingly embarrassing later in life, um, through the death and dying experience. Uh, those are things that we need to consider the digital ecosystem throughout our entire lives these days. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to check all my other email addresses now. <laughs> uh, please, it, it isn't about checking all of your email addresses, but do look at your digital life and ask which ones are important and start to lock these down. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Federica. <laughs>